Okay, this lecture covers the last topic here for our unit on electricity and magnetism. Today's topic is electromagnetism. Okay, previously in this unit we have seen the electric force and then separate from that we've seen the magnetic force. We've also seen that there are similarities between the two forces. So for example, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. On a magnet, like poles repel, opposite poles attract. In addition, each individual force obeys an inverse square law. We also saw later on in this unit that a magnetic field, for example, exerts a force on a moving electrical charge. It exerts a force on an electrical current. So then therefore there must be a connection between the two. There is. The connection between electricity and magnetism, what's just generically referred to as electromagnetism, basically comes from two fundamental relationships, Ampere's Law and Faraday's Law. I'm going to give you a basic introduction to both of those laws here today, and I'm also showing you a number of demonstrations associated with those laws in my short demonstrations videos in today's folder. Okay, so now with regards to electromagnetism, let's approach electromagnetism by just jumping back a little bit and noting the following. If we have, for example, a conventional current, the force that is exerted upon that conventional current due to a magnetic field B is described by this expression. If you have a moving electrical charge, then the force exerted upon it due to a magnetic field is described by this expression. And then if you recall, the direction of the force itself is governed by what is referred to as right-hand rule. So basically, to summarize these two expressions, in the presence of a magnetic field, that magnetic field then exerts a force on a moving electrical charge, whether it be a conventional current or an individual charge itself with some velocity v. Think of that, however, from Newton's third law as the action. So then therefore, what is the reaction? In other words, the moving electrical charge or the conventional current has to exert a force back on whatever it is that's causing the magnetic field. That's illustrated in Ampere's Law. Okay, now Ampere's Law, without going through the mathematics, basically says the following. A moving electrical charge creates a magnetic field. This is the source of all magnetic fields. All magnetic fields are caused by moving electrical charges. Pause this lecture right now and take a look at my demonstration video of Ampere's Law. Okay, now that you've seen that demonstration video, here's basically what you saw in that demonstration video. Okay, let's say that right here is my conventional current I flowing in this direction. This was the L-shaped wire that I used in the demonstration video. And then surrounding that L-shaped wire, this is the vertical portion of it, you saw all of my individual compass needles. And then I turned on the conventional current, and when I did, that then generates a magnetic field, and then the compass needles all lined up with the magnetic field line itself. What the compass needles were tracing out was a circle. A circle that is centered here, for example, on the conventional current. Now, you have to think three-dimensionally on this diagram as I draw it, like so. This right here is the center of the red circle that I am drawing, and then the red circle passes behind the current here in blue in the background of the diagram. It passes here in front, however, of the conventional current at the front of the diagram. This is the magnetic field line. This is what the compass needles were tracing out. It's a circle, once again, centered on the wire itself. The direction of the magnetic field is described once again by right-hand rule. What we do in this case is we take the fingers of our right hand and we then curl them in this direction like so. The direction that our thumb points is the direction of the conventional current I. So then therefore the red magnetic field line here traces out a circle that follows the curl of my fingers in my right hand. So that then looks like this. 
There is a very detailed mathematical expression that goes along with describing Ampere's law. It's not necessary for our purposes here to go through those mathematics. The mathematics behind Ampere's law, it turns out, is actually quite difficult. Quite frankly, we save that for the AP Physics C level. Okay, go ahead at this point and pause the film and go ahead and take a look at my two application demonstrations of Ampere's law. I show you two demonstrations. The first one involves an electromagnet and the second one involves an electric motor. Go ahead and take a look at those two demonstrations now. Okay, here's what you saw in the first of those demonstrations in the application of Ampere's law. This is an electromagnet. And let me do a little bit of erasing here. Okay, so with an electromagnet, basically what I have here is just a single coil of wire, like so, and then this type of configuration is referred to as a solenoid. And then I'm passing a conventional current here through the solenoid. Let's just say the current flows in this direction, like so. And then as you, as you saw in my demonstration, I had this hooked up to a transformer. I had it hooked up to a battery. Okay, and then the magnetic field that is created here inside of the solenoid and surrounding the solenoid looks like this. Like so, where the field lines then here in red point in this direction, like so. Notice the magnetic field shape that results. This is a dipole magnetic field. Outside of the solenoid, the magnetic field is rather weak. That's why the solenoid was not able to pick up the paper clip. However, inside the solenoid, notice how tightly wrapped, if you will, or really spaced closely together the magnetic field lines are. This then means that the magnitude of the magnetic field inside the solenoid is rather large, and then therefore inside the solenoid it was able to easily pick up the paper clip. So that's what you were seeing in that demonstration. But the shape of the field that results is in fact a dipole magnetic field. This now allows us to understand the cause of the Earth's magnetic field and why it has that shape. So jump back to the following description of the Earth's magnetic field from an earlier lecture. Okay, so let's say right here is the Earth, here's the Earth's equator, it's geographic north and south poles like so, and then recall that the dipole magnetic field associated with the Earth looks like this. Okay, so now, if a moving electrical charge is the cause of a magnetic field, where are the moving electrical charges here when you're talking about the Earth as a whole? It's within the Earth's outer core. The Earth's outer core is basically a molten metal. And then as the Earth rotates, the Earth's outer core is also rotating. It behaves much like a solenoid does. This then generates the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's outer core is basically molten metal. So it's a conducting fluid. And it behaves like a solenoid as the Earth rotates. producing then, for example, here, a dipole magnetic field. So this is one of the reasons why we know that the Earth's outer core is a liquid, because ultimately it's the source of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, now let me kind of summarize Ampere's law for you in the following way. What is really this deeper connection, if you will, between electricity and magnetism? Well, kind of think of that connection in the following way. So I have here my plastic rod that you've seen before, and I have here some rabbit fur. Let me go ahead and just rub this up like so, and then therefore I'm gonna go ahead and give this an electrical charge. Now, if this electrical charge is stationary with respect to me, 
This then means that I see an electric field. However, let's say that I walk relative to you with the electrical charge. Let's say, for example, that I do this. So the electrical charge is stationary with respect to me, but it is moving with respect to you. You see a moving electrical charge, therefore you don't see an electric field, instead you see a magnetic field. So there really is no difference per se between an electric field and a magnetic field in the following sense. It's a relativity situation. So if you are stationary with respect to an electrical charge, you then see an electric field. However, if that electrical charge is moving with respect to you, then you see a magnetic field. In other words, magnetic fields and electric fields are different signs, if you will, of the exact same thing, what is referred to as the force of electromagnetism. The force of electromagnetism, like the force of gravity, is considered fundamental to nature. Okay, let me go ahead and pause this portion of the film right here. And now at this point, what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at the electric motor demonstration if you have not yet already done so. Okay, so here's basically what you saw in the electric motor demonstration. You have, first of all, a permanent magnet that is present. That permanent magnet is drawn like this. Let's say here's the North Pole. And then here's the South Pole. Okay, and then I have a coil of wire which is ultimately connected to a battery, connected to a potential difference. Let me go ahead and draw that wire with its potential difference like so. So here's the battery with a voltage V. And then I'm going to draw the following. Like so. And then here and here, I'm going to introduce what are referred to as brushes. Here and here. And then you turn on the conventional current, so the current then flows through the wire. And it does so in this direction, like so, I on my diagram. Okay, take a look at the two sides, here and here. Right over here to the right, the current is flowing like so. Here to the left, the current is flowing like so. There is a magnetic field that is present here on this diagram. That magnetic field flows from left to right on my diagram from north to south, like so. Okay, now just take a look at this expression. F equals IL times B, and we'll use right-hand rule to understand the two forces that are important here on this diagram. They occur on the left and right-hand sides. Okay, first of all, right over here on the left, the conventional current I is flowing like so. I then curl my fingers in my right hand in the direction of the magnetic field, and this then gives me the direction of the force vector, which is my thumb. Notice that's into the board. So there's a force like so. And then over here on the right-hand side, well, the force in this case is going to be in the opposite direction. In this case, what we have is the conventional current pointing downwards like so. I then curl my fingers in my right hand in the direction of the B field, and then my thumb points out of the board like so. So there's a force out of the board here on the left, and a force into the board on the right-hand side. And then basically the armature here, as it's called, the rectangular portion of this diagram, this then begins to rotate like so. When it begins to rotate, however, it loses contact right here with the battery momentarily by means of these metal brushes. And it basically then just rotates from its own momentum until it comes in contact with the brushes once again, and then the force vectors occur once again. So for every 180 degree rotation of this rectangle, it comes in contact with these metal brushes, as they're called, these conducting brushes that are connected to the battery such that the current flows, and then the force vectors occur. So it's kind of like it gets a kick, if you will, in this direction as it rotates twice per rotation. So you get a kick like so, kick like so, kick like so, kick like so, and so on. So then therefore, what we're doing here in terms of an energy transformation is we're making use of Ampere's law. We're taking the energy associated with an electrical current that ultimately comes from the battery, of course, and then we're converting it into rotational kinetic energy. 
Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the lecture right here. I'm gonna call this part one. Part one is basically covering Ampere's law. I'll do part two in just a few moments, which covers what is called Faraday's law.